This is Isaac Morehouse. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, big ideas, how to put them into practice in the real world, and above all, how to live free. How to go from zero to a startup job in nine months. You don't need to jump through hoops or blast out resumes. You can start today. Praxis combines a three-month professional boot camp with a six-month paid apprenticeship at a startup that leads directly to a full-time job. Startups aren't just for coders, sales, marketing, operations. Even if you're not sure what you're interested in, Praxis places you with a dynamic, growing company where you do work you love, become part of a team, and make a difference. Praxis is tailored to your goals and your interests coaching sessions, group discussions with your peers, skills training, and a portfolio of projects along with the apprenticeship create a powerful combination of real-world experience and intensive learning. We are relentlessly committed to helping you discover and do what makes you come alive. We don't just prepare you for a job, we actually give you one. No degree is required to get started on your career. Whether you're an ambitious go-getter right out of high school, a creative thinker who's bored in college, or a college grad looking for the next step, discover Praxis. Great jobs are waiting. Are you ready? Today, I am very excited to have on the show, Stefan Kinsella. This is actually when I first launched the podcast, when I made my first list of potential guests I wanted to have, Stefan was on that very first list and it's taken over a year for whatever reason to (laughs) just get him on the show and uh, do an episode about intellectual property. Uh, So Stefan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here. So briefly introducing you, and I know your bio is uh, much more deep and wide. Stefan is a patent lawyer, uh, (laughs) interestingly enough, has been for uh, almost 25 years now. He also has a podcast. He is a scholar, uh, has written many both sort of popular and scholarly articles on Everything from intellectual property, which is our subject today, to you know um, all kinds of uh, legal theory, uh, the philosophy of liberty, many, many more. He's he's kind of the foremost expert on intellectual property, um, certainly from a free market uh, standpoint. He's the founder and director of the Center for. Hold on, I'm going to get the name wrong. Let me make sure I get it right. The uh, the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Um, which is really focused on the intellectual property topic. So, Stefan, uh, what did I miss in your bio that's important? You got it right. Um, I uh, a, a quick uh, summary of my path was in 82, I became a libertarian through reading Rand in high school. And around 88 in law school, I became an anarchist after reading Rothbard and the others. And around 1992 or so, 1993, I started practicing patent law, and that's right when I became anti-IP at the same time. So right when I learned enough (laughs) about IP law to start practicing it, I also learned enough to realize that it was completely incompatible with libertarian property rights. Yeah, so let's let's jump right in there because that was was one of the first things I wanted to ask you. How did you get into, um, you know, the the issue, the the interested in the issue of the intellectual property and. and how have you sort of maintained a career as a patent attorney <laughs> while you've had this philosophical position in opposition to IP? So, so how did it start? Yeah, well, uh, just reading reading the basics of libertarian theory, like uh, when I was younger in college and even earlier, Ayn Rand's defense of intellectual property. Um, you know, they never quite made sense to me like the other stuff did because she's like in favor of this patent system, which gives you a monopoly over an invention, but for seventeen years. And copyright gives you a monopoly over an idea, but for you know sixty or seventy years, but it's it's like an arbitrary time frame, and that doesn't see didn't seem right to me. I said there's something wrong with this because natural rights last forever if they're justified. So I I just put it on the back burner, and I figured I figured they knew more than I did about it, and um, I kept thinking about it. And when I went to law school, I thought more. Um, when I, I started practicing in a different field, intellectual, uh, international law and, and oil and gas or energy law. 
but I finally switched over to patents because the uh, the tech field was really good at the time uh, in law, the patent law field. So I switched over. And at that time, I just started thinking more and more about it, and I started doing a lot more reading. I read works by Wendy McElroy, who I really think is basically the pioneer in libertarian theory and intellectual property. Uh, I, I really think she's the first one who basically got it right. Um, uh, she didn't flesh it out completely, but she she was there with Sam Konkin um, and Benjamin Tucker before her, who she would studied. But Benjamin Tucker's reasoning was not exactly right. He was sort of against monopolies uh, for the same reason he was against monopolies in land. So you can see that his reasoning wasn't quite pure libertarian on this. Uh, but Sam Konkin and Wendy McElroy really got it right, I think, especially Wendy. And uh, and then Tom Palmer started writing some really good, more advanced stuff in the 90s. So I read all that and some other people's works, and I finally came to the conclusion, oh, the reason I'm having trouble justifying this, because I thought you know, I know more about IP than most libertarians because I'm practicing it. I can be the one who finally figures this out and explains why it's – why it is justified after <laughs> all. Why – I'll give a better explanation than Rand did, which by the way is what uh, her chief sort of uh, legal disciple right now, Adam Mossoff, has been trying to do for a dozen years now or so. He He keeps promising – to come up with some kind of defensive IP that is, I guess, better than Rand's, but he just keeps repeating what she said, as far as I can tell, uh, and mixing it in with like utilitarian arguments like those of Richard Epstein. So, uh, but I, on the other hand, finally concluded that the reason I was having trouble finding a good argument for IP was because for the same reason I would have trouble finding an argument for slavery. It's because it can't be justified. Um, so that was that was my path, and the, the the basic reasoning I came to was not really utilitarian, although I think uh, empirical arguments or the fact the factual evidence about the effectiveness of patent and copyright um, is overwhelmingly negative. It shows that uh, these systems are very dangerous to innovation and to culture and to freedom. Um, and to prosperity as well because patents suppress innovation and make us poorer literally because we have less technological um, achievements and innovations now than we otherwise would if patents weren't slowing down the whole process. Um, but that's not the primary argument against it. The primary argument is just understanding what these rights are and how they work, and if you understand the basics, just the simple basics of libertarian uh, property rights, you'll see that there's a complete conflict between those two. So let's let's start with a brief definition of because you've mentioned patents and copyrights. Mm -hmm. You haven't mentioned trademarks, which is something that people bring up a lot to me. Um, you know, like, well, oh, you've got to have a, you know, you can't just say that you're representing Nike and you don't really represent Nike, whatever. And and they kind of get all these things confused. So yep. could you give me a brief definition first Absolutely. of trademark, which seems a little simpler to me, and then copyright and patent. So you have these. There's 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 four classically defined types of intellectual property or IP, and they are uh, copyright and patent and trademark and also trade secret. Mm -hmm. You could loosely group a few other legal rights under this rubric too if you wanted to, like uh, reputation rights or defamation law and a few others. Uh, well, there's And there's some newer ones like um, uh, mask work protection for integrated circuits, which is sort of like a, a hybrid of copyright. But anyway, a trademark is simply a mark used um, to identify the source of goods or services in commerce, and the law gives certain rights to the user of that mark. Okay, it's like a think of a brand name like Coca Cola or or the name Apple, Apple Computer Company, or Exxon. Uh, those are examples of trademarks. So it's just a mark. Um, copyright is the right of an author of an original creative work, like a novel or a painting or software code nowadays. Um, and it lasts over a century in most cases. A patent is a limited monopoly to be the exclusive person who can practice an invention. That's a creative um, – I'm sorry. That's an inventive, useful process or machine basically. And then the trade secret is just some information you have that's, that, that, that is useful to you to keep secret and that you do keep secret for the most part, like a customer list or even – um, uh, a process for making a chemical that you don't reveal to the public publicly like you would if you were selling, say, a mousetrap with a new design. You reveal that to the public when you sell it, so you wouldn't be able to keep a trade secret on that because it's just not secret. So those are the four classic types of intellectual property. They were never called 
intellectual property originally until fairly recently. They were four, say, distinct rights. Trademark did arise partly on the common law, so did trade secret. Uh, patent and copyright were rooted in uh, like executive action of the monarchs or statutes. So copyright arose um, in the statute of Anne of 1709 in England and some previous uh, statutes before that. And patents arose in what's called the statute of monopolies in 1623 in England, which was a statute by the parliament – which was meant to crack down on the egregious habit of the monarch in granting monopolies to favored uh, cronies and tax collectors and people like that in different towns, saying you're the only one who can make playing cards in this town. You're the in exchange for you know you giving me some of your uh, for helping me collect taxes or being protected from competition, etc. And this practice got to be so egregious and it was such a mercantilist and protectionist thing. That the parliament passed a statute called the Statute of Monopolies, basically restricting the king's ability to grant these monopolies, except they made an exception for – they said, well, you, you can keep granting them for innovative uh, inventions basically. Mm -hmm. So they made an exception for inventions, so they re the king retained the ability to grant these monopolies for inventions, for inventive uh, processes. So that's the sort of the roots of these, um, of these uh, legal regimes, and – in the 1800s, uh, patents, especially patents and copyright, especially patents, were coming under attack by free market economists worldwide. I mean a lot of countries abolished it for a good 50 years, like the, uh, I think Switzerland or the Netherlands, because um, they were just obviously ways to protect someone from competition. The, the government literally grants you a monopoly for 17 years or something saying you, no one else can compete with you in this field because the government is – uh, approved your, your your application process, um, and so some so they these this practice is clearly anti free market and anti competition and pro monopoly, and so the free market economists were like universally condemning it. They're saying, "What the hell's going on here?" And so the defenders, the entrenched interests who were relying upon these monopolies, uh, you know, the car industry, et cetera, um, the uh, printing industry, the publishing industry. They started saying, no, 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 no. It's it's not a monopoly. It's a property right. It's just a different type of property right. It's a type of property that comes from the intellect. <laughs> so let's call it intellectual property. And we're all in favor of property rights, right? And so it's really a natural right. Um, admittedly, it doesn't last forever like other types of natural rights. That's because it's special. So the defenders of the these special legal privileges came up with the term IP to – make people think of it like it's a normal type of property. And so no, most people who don't think about these matters and who are naturally in favor of property rights, like in their cars and in their homes and in their farms, you know, they're thinking, well, I guess if I'm in favor of property rights, I should be in favor of this type of property right too. Yeah. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's why it's called IP. That's exactly how I started out. You know, it reminds me of the way that you can sort of do that sleight of hand and turn something into a right. Um, a taxi driver recently telling me that, you know, he's offended by Uber because he bought this medallion and that's his prop. He has a property, right? And Uber is undermining the value yes. of that. And yes. that somehow is, or, or people back in, in the housing crisis, they felt like they actually had a right to the value of their home increasing. Yeah. Like, no, 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 you own the property, but you don't yeah. have a right to command a specific price on the market. But it's, a, it's an easy sleight of hand. One more thing that you mentioned that I wanted to just highlight was in the origin of these, this is something that comes up on this podcast a lot, the difference between emergent uh, sort of common law or institutions that emerge naturally from people interacting with each other over time as a way to, to produce harmony versus sort of imposed from on high centralized, you know, diktats that are, you know, using force to impose something that is not really uh, creating harmony and peace. And the difference, you know, trademark and trade secrets, I can see very easily how if you're lying and pretending to be Isaac Morehouse or you're claiming that, you know, your product is, you know, made by my company and it's not, or you've stolen, you worked for me and you stole something that you agreed not to share and then you go share it. It makes total sense that the common law tradition would sort of evolve such that I could come and say, no, 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 you, you owe me damages for lying and claiming to be me. And that seems very natural to me. Whereas these other things, I can't really see any natural way that 
they would emerge in the common law. You have to have some central force saying no one is allowed to produce this except for you. Um, yeah. it, they, they, just the origin alone should make us be suspect of the copyright and patent, uh, you know, IP laws. I, I agree. Uh, on your previous point, just for a second, uh, about uh, these uh, these artificial rights and rights and value, and uh, it, it just reminds me a little bit of these these Tea Partiers a few years ago. If you remember, they were saying something like, "We want the government to keep their cotton picking hands off of our social security." It's like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you understand the social security comes from the government taxing me, but um, so here. I actually am totally opposed to trademark law as well, and I'll, I'll, I can explain why if we have time to get into it. Um, if, in my original book I wrote in 2000 and 2001 on this, I kind of said, well, trademark as currently written is problematic, um, but it, the core of it you could defend maybe on fraud grounds or something like that. Uh, but now I've, I've, come, I've come even further uh, against trademark, but I don't focus on it as much because in my mind, if you rank the harm done by these laws – Clearly, patent and copyright are the worst by far, by far. Um, now, I go back and forth over which one is more evil. Um, I actually think tr patent law is the worst in terms of the, 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 the tangible damage it does to society because it I – would, I would look at the patent system as like a, a $10 trillion a year tax on, on the, the world economy or something maybe even worse. It basically is a huge uh, barrier to innovation and therefore to – to actual wealth and progress. Though, though as uh, software is, is taking over everything, I suspect that, that maybe copyright is quickly catching up. Yes. However, um, um, uh, because of some unique differences between patent and copyright, now copyright lasts longer. However, it only protects, it only stops you from copying. So it's theoretically possible to have a similar product as long as it uh, wasn't copied. Whereas in patents, even if you in independently invent something, you still can't practice it. So, and, and not only that, there has been the rise of this open uh, software, um, what do you call it, free software movement, right? Um, where so the the I would say the bulk of of, of, of innovation in software now is done under the rubric of all these uh, uh, free software licenses. So they basically, in effect, opted out of the copyright system, which you, it's not as easy to do in the patent world anyway. So. Copyright is less of a threat to software development, I think. Um, the problem is while copyright doesn't do as much financial or, or tangible harm, it does – it is more insidious in the, in the sense that, it, number one, it distorts culture heavily because it distorts the type of movies that are made, songs that are sung, remixing, and all this stuff. It, it makes people think twice about publishing or engaging in projects because they know that certain things are not permitted by copyright. Uh, and it also lasts much longer, well over a century, um, and it's also being used by the government um, to increasingly ratchet up controls over the internet to like shut sites down. Which, and since I regard the internet as a key tool uh, in the battle against the state, copyright is more more insidious and more dangerous in a sense than um, than patent. So if I if ever given the choice to abolish one, I, I probably would abolish patents just because it's hurting people so much um, in terms of their their daily lives, how much wealth we have. Um, but copyright would be up there. Um, and if you want to talk in a minute or now about trademark, I can explain what is really yeah yeah wrong. go go so, for it. So everyone says like like you sort of say um, uh, you know, there's something wrong with lying and and faking your identity. And what you're getting there at is that. Uh, libertarians sort of have this vague – and when I say vague, a lot of people don't really define it or they all define it sort of differently. But we're, we're usually – we usually say we're against aggression, which is the initiation of force against your body or your property, and then we'll just throw in or the threat of that, okay, which I think takes some work to justify. People just assume that, or fraud. See, they'll just say or fraud like it's obvious what that means. <laughs> now, what they have in mind is some kind of – some kind of way of using deception to take advantage of someone and basically cheat them somehow in, in some kind of measurable way. And so that instinct is right. I think ultimately fraud is an unlibertarian thing, is a type of aggression because it's basically what I would call theft by trick, which is what the common law does call one type of fraud, theft by trick. So you're basically gaining um, possession of someone else's owned resources 
by deceiving them about the nature of what you're giving them. So it's a way of getting unjust or unfair title to their property, which you shouldn't have. So it's a type of conversion or, or theft. You can think of it that way. The problem is fraud is already illegal. So if you say, well, we need trademarks because fraud should be illegal, it's mm. like, wait a second. We, we already have contract law, and we already have fraud law. Those two things together already cover the cases where a consumer is deceived by someone, like someone pretending to be Isaac Morehouse. You know, and That's going to catch up with the deceiver one way or the other. They're going to have a bad reputation. They're going to get fired when they get caught out. They're going to lose their customers. They're going to get sued for fraud. They're not going to get credit from someone because they think they're shady, or they're going to get sued for breach of contract. So in other words, trademark law is either just redundant with those things, in which case why do we need it, or it's something else. And I believe it's something else because, um, number one, if a, consumer, if a consumer is defrauded by someone, the person that has been defrauded is the victim, which is the consumer, and that person should have the – the right of action, right, to, to sue the person who deceived them, the defrauder, and that is how fraud law and contract law work. Under trademark law, the plaintiff is the person who holds the trademark, mm. so not the not the deceived customer. Okay, so for example, if if um, if someone sells a knockoff Chanel bag to a customer, Chanel can sue that that knockoff manufacturer, not the customer. Under, under trademark law. So that's one problem with it. The other problem is you don't have to show fraud. You just have to show likelihood of consumer confusion. But in, in the case of the Chanel knockoff bags, the people buying these bags for $20 instead of for $2,000, <laughs> they're not defrauded at all. They know they're buying a knockoff bag. So there like literally is no fraud in those cases. Yeah, I bought a Nike bag in quotes in uh, Mexico one time. And you know the, the swoosh logo was like, out of proportion. I mean, it was just exactly. clearly, you know, it's like you're, it was just, I was just doing it to be funny, clearly buying. It was funny because it was obviously not a Nike bag. There was no, right. you know, yeah, it's interesting. And so, and so, and so, and, and then one more thing in the, in, in recent years, about 20, 30 years ago, the trademark law was amended to add this anti-dilution cause of action, which is if the owner of a so-called famous mark can prove that Someone is using it in a way that tarnishes or dilutes the value of their mark. Even if there's not likelihood of consumer confusion, they can still get an injunction and go seize the bags and crush them. And that goes to what you mentioned earlier, which is this belief that property rights are property rights in value as opposed to the property right in the physical integrity of a physical owned resource. Um, because so you have Nike or someone or Chanel, they claim that they have a certain uh, goodwill. Or some other kind of intangible accounting type concept value in their reputation, and therefore, uh, if someone else does something to dilute that, then they're damaging them by reducing the value of their proper of their of their reputation in the eyes of consumers, and therefore they should have a cause of action against that that interloper, which is very similar, if you notice, to defamation law, which is the idea that you have a reputation right, and if someone lies about you. In a way that harms your reputation, which makes you, you you lose value in your reputation that you have a right to sue too, which is why I personally classify defamation rights um, as a type of IP, even though most IP lawyers don't. Uh, and interestingly, Rothbard in his Ethics of Liberty had a kind of bizarre he he attacked the patent system uh, on somewhat reasonable grounds. He attacked defamation law. On good grounds, he noted that if you have a right to your reputation, it means you own other people's brains because you're owning what people think about you, right? And so he understood that that's wrong. But he didn't quite see that that's almost the same argument you would use against trademark law because it's also a reputation right type system. And then he had this weird contract based defense of copyright, um, which doesn't work if you just trace it out. And that's another reason I think some people are confused on. Some libertarians are confused on IP is because no one up until maybe the late 90s really started sorting this stuff out clearly. It seems to be an area where, and I did this myself for many years, where, you know, once you arrive at a very logically consistent, um, either from a, a moral standpoint or a consequentialist standpoint or both, a, a principled understanding of why liberty and property rights and free markets and all these things matter, you, you come to the issue of IP and every thinker just sort of like 
does these weird gymnastics to say like, well, maybe this isn't quite right, but then this is good. But then like, it's like everyone's yeah. afraid to just fully let it go as I was. Cause I, one, I just wasn't that interested in it. So I didn't want to put in the time, but I was just sort of like, well, I did it just, it just kind of has to exist. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was afraid too, because I was a, a budding patent lawyer and I was, I would write these little articles very cautiously, like maybe we could look at it this way, or maybe we should think about these questions. And because I was afraid it would hurt my career, and the more radical I got, and the more I realized that my clients and my and my colleagues don't care about this, they don't care about normative theory, and they're not reading <laughs> anyway. And I just started getting more. I, I would like I started getting more brash over the, over the years. I like I just would. You know, clients hire you because of how good you are at your craft. And in fact, if if you have a very articulate, strong opinion against the patent system, it, it, people want to hire me more because they say, "Well, he must know he must know the system really well." So it, it never hurt me in my career. But what the, what you just mentioned reminded me of something I, I learned of a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Mises has these kind of bizarre, cryptic comments in Human Action on the patent system where he basically admits that it's a monopoly and he sort of gives the pros and cons of it, but he doesn't really – so he says, well, if you don't have a, mon a monopoly on ideas, then you're going to have this economic effect. But if you do, you're going to have this effect, and then he just sort of trails off and lets it go. And Israel Kirzner, who actually has some tantalizingly good comments on um, uh, on uh, IP, uh, and he had a comment in a uh, – a Q&A session on some lecture a couple of years ago. Someone asked him about IP and Mises or something. He said, you know, Mises was one of these really rigid, logical uh, uh, guys that always had an opinion, right? And he said the only thing he never had – or that the only thing that, that he was not like Mises on was IP. People would say, hey, Mises, what do you think about IP? And he would say, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. And he said that <laughs> Mises would never do that on any other topic. He's like, socialism is wrong. You know, or property rights are great, but on IP it was like, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. So it's, it trips up a lot of people. It, it's in in some ways I almost feel like at least for me it was it was a fundamentally it was a lack of imagination, an inability to sort of. It's like, well, I don't, I can't theoretically explain in any consistent way any theory of intellectual property that makes sense. But I also can't imagine a world without it because I've been so conditioned to believe that no innovation would happen without these legal monopoly grants that, you know, I guess we'd still be living at subsistence level. And that doesn't sound, you know, it was just, it's, I think it's just a, a lack of imagination and really understanding of history because that's not at all yeah, uh, I think, the way that it works. It, yeah, and really the libertarian movement is relatively young. Let's say the modern movement is about 60, 70 years old. And we all came of age in a world where IP law had already existed in the Western capitalist or more or less capitalist systems and where our sort of progenitors and forebears either didn't talk about IP very much or they were kind of for it because they all assumed that you know, it's part of a private property order. It's in the U.S. Constitution. Um, it must be sort of one weird specialized arcane aspect of a capitalist order, and we're used to it, and it's hard to imagine what it's like without it. But on a more principled or theoretical level, I think – I think the mistake, to be honest, came from, from Locke, um, and we inherited a lot of our thinking from Lockean-type style analysis and his principal view of the nature and role of property and man's rights and limited government uh, or government itself. And he's got this framework where he talks about homesteading things and mixing your labor, and the way he argues is that the reason you own – uh, say a, a, a field that you you find unowned in the state of nature and you transform it into a farm you know or a, a house or something the reason you own that is because number one you own yourself because God owned the earth God gave the earth to mankind in common and he gave every person ownership of themselves and if you own yourself you own your labor because you generate your labor now, you can see already this is getting to be kind of metaphorical and shaky, not really rigorous. And if you own your labor, you know, so like there's this picture of these labor substance sort of emanating from your body. And then if you mix your labor with some unknown thing, it gets so intertwined with it that for you to keep ownership of your labor, you have to keep ownership of all these molecules that your labor is sort of mixed in with. Okay. So his argument is this kind of complicated 
almost uh, overly metaphorical, almost mystical argument where you just picture us as owning our labor and then owning the fruits of labor, whatever. That's another metaphor. The fruits of labor is not really literally fruit. I mean you do own fruits of a tree that you own, but to extend that to the fruits of your labor just means whatever results from your labor because you owned it. Um, and then that leads to this idea that that one of the sources of ownership – now this is very common among libertarians. If you ask a, a principal diehard libertarian what are the sources of ownership, they will, they will say, well, number one, you can have a contract where you acquire the resource from a previous owner. That's correct. Um, right, Or you could homestead some unowned thing because you mix your labor with it, and then you become the first owner by original appropriation or by creation or production, they'll say. So if you produce something or you create something, then you own it. Now, if you believe that, that's a th that those three things are the three sources of property rights, then you start thinking of creation as a source of property. So if you create something of value like an idea or a recipe or a song, well, if anyone owns it, shouldn't it be the creator? right? So you're already thinking in your mind that creation is one of the three sources of ownership, and that's the fundamental mistake. That comes from this Lockean concept of that you own your body, therefore you own your labor. That's the mistake right there. You don't own your labor. Labor is just an action. You don't own your actions. Your actions are what you do with your body, which you do own. To say that you own your body and your actions is like double counting, and it gets you into all these errors. And it also gets you to this idea that you own value of your resources, like we said earlier. So all this stuff is mixed in together. The the mistake is, is, is in thinking that creation is an independent source of ownership. It is actually not. Only contract and only original appropriation. That is the only two legitimate ways to acquire ownership to a resource. Creation is really what creation means. Uh, is And by the way, Mises and Rothbard and even Ayn Rand recognize this in their various writings. Creation is simply production, which means rearranging or transforming an already owned resource into a new arrangement that's more useful or more wealthy to you or more valuable. But it doesn't mean you come up with a new property right. So if you take a, a, a big piece of marble and you carve a statue out of it, now you have a more valuable piece of marble. But you own the, the statue not because you created it but because you already owned the big hunk of marble. If you didn't own the big hunk of marble, you wouldn't have had the right to, to, to chip away a statue yeah, there, out There's it. no additional right that you've now added to the ownership of the marble because you did something new to it. You've created wealth. Yeah. But you haven't created you haven't created property. You know, for me, I had I had come to the theoretical position of like, okay, first I don't think there's any coherent way to define intellectual property, certainly not in a way that doesn't also at least sometimes violate physical property. Uh, you know, if I'm not allowed to, you know, mix two chemicals that I own in a certain way and sell them because somebody else already did it, that's that's a violation of my sort of physical property. Right. So I, I was sort of on board that this is theoretically bankrupt. It's it's right. inconsistent. It's and it's you know it's it's unethical. It's got problems. But I still had this sort of like, yeah, but it it kind of like has to exist. Otherwise, right. innovation won't occur. And, and what opened my eyes was th this is um, by the way a similar sort of very simple argument that John Hasness makes for anarchy and in, in, uh, yes. the obviousness of anarchy, which is look around. It's actually already here. We don't need yes. to imagine yes. what the world would look like. It actually is already here. And when I found out that. The fashion industry, uh, the cooking industry in terms of recipes and things like that. I started thinking about football and great coaches who make up innovative plays and schemes. None of those things have any intellectual property protection, and yet they're some of the most innovative, dynamic areas uh, of any industry. And it was sort of like, you don't have to imagine what the world would be like. It, and then I started looking back in history, Boldrin and Levine's uh, book, yep. and, and started realizing – very recent history, as well as even today, there are examples everywhere of no IP protections and innovation yes. is not curbed. In fact, it's stronger in those areas. Yeah, and in fact, if you point this out to people, well, of course, the the IP diehards are all are always advocating for more IP rights. So there is a movement, of course, to get uh, uh, fashion fashion industry type IP rights enacted, uh, as if we don't have enough fashion innovation already, right? And then. You know, of course, in Europe right now they're trying to get this special copyright, um, which is a copyright in news, newspaper headlines, so that Google would have to pay to have snippets of just the title of, a, of an wow. article. To so there, there's always a movement towards more of this, and of course, if you view it as IP, you're thinking, well, more property is good, you know. But of course, the truth is that 
real property rights can never conflict with each other. And if you add positive rights, which is what these are, it yes. always comes at the expense of, of le uh, legitimate rights. Uh, and by the way, um, I, Hasness is one of these guys who doesn't write a lot, but he writes some things that are so classic. Uh, his other one is The Myth of the Rule of Law. Yes. Those are two classic, powerful articles. And there's another one that's similar by Alfred Kuzan in an early JL, General Libertarian Studies called Do We Ever – Really es get out escape of anarchy. anarchy. Yes. Oh, that's and I don't even favorites. think he's a libertarian. Um, but it, that's it's such a great article. He points out that we already have anarchy ab among the governments of the world, and even within a government, there's like you know, Obama doesn't have guns pointed at the people that obey his orders. There's an internal order in the state itself yep. that works for some reason, doesn't work well. But um, as for uh, Boulder and Levine, their, their your great book is against intellectual monopoly. That's probably the strongest free market case against. Um, IP uh, that's not really on a principled libertarian. I mean, it's just purely empirical. But it's it's. I, I believe they started the book thinking they would find all kinds of evidence for patent and copyright, but they they ended up realizing that it's there's like no evidence for it, and the evidence goes the other way. So they ended up changing their conclusions, you know, to their credit. Oh wow. Um, but you you did mention something earlier. I didn't. I, I think I, I, I failed to um, to answer, and that was about the common law and natural. Rights and um, it is true that trade secret and tr and trademark law arose mostly on the common law and originally the function of trademark was consumer protection so you can see a route to fraud there it's just gone out of it's gotten out of the bounds of that um, and trade secret had some rough justification too although I'm against trade secret law and I can explain why there although it's such a small area. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it seems like contract law would would cover anything you needed covered. If if you have made a agreement with me that you will not, you know, a non disclosure yes. agreement would cover it. Yeah, and the way trade secret law works is that you need non disclosure agreements just to prove to the court that you were trying to keep something secret, making a diligent effort, so that if one of your let's say one of your employees leaves and he goes to work for another company, you can get an injunction against the other company not just your employee but you so like <laughs> if he reveals the secret to some, some third parties who didn't sign the nda and who aren't bound by contract as long as they haven't publicly revealed the secret because once it's made public it's not a secret anymore and you have no trade secret protection you, you can't you can't put the genie back in the bottle but if it's still possible to put the genie back in the bottle like like your former employee has told you know five people at this new company the government will come in and they will issue an injunction against these five people, and they will say you are forbidden to use or think about or discuss or reveal this information under penalty of um, uh, contempt of court, which means going to jail. So the problem I have with trade secret law is that it, it, it is not based in contract. It is basically the threat of jail, physical force against third parties who did not have a contract with the original um, holder of the so-called secret. OK, so that's the problem with trade secret law, although it's, again, not as dangerous or bad. Trade secret law probably does the least damage of all, although, I mean, if you remember when that Apple iPhone 4 was left on a bar somewhere, on a bar stool about oh. five, <laughs> Apple, Apple employees with the local police, or maybe it was federal police, I can't remember, they showed up at the apartment of the guy that had found the iPhone, OK? Using trade secret law as their justification, burst into his home, and they forced him to turn it over. Now, this guy didn't have a contract. It was an Apple employee who lost the phone. Now, I, I could see re recovering your property. I would say Apple still owned the property. I, I wouldn't argue they had abandoned it. They lost it. Uh, but if the guy learned something from the phone in, in the brief duration that he had possession of it, you know, he's, he's free to use that information however he wants. But he's not under trade secret law. So that's my problem with that. But let me go back one step. What I was going to say about the common law was those two rights did emerge gradually under, under common law, and there was also something called common law copyright. Now, what that was, it was very much like trade secret. All it said was – if, and this is back in the days before the internet, of course, and, and uh, if, if you're like an author and you have a manuscript of an unpublished work in your desk drawer, like you're a professor somewhere, and someone steals – sneaks into your office – steals that manuscript and goes to a printer and tries to publish it you can get you could you could prevent them from publishing it first because you have the right to publish it first because you're the author and they had to obtain the manuscript basically by by theft so 
that's what common law copyright is, and it's been superseded by the modern copyright law. So there was a current – but you can see that that's really rooted more in trade secret type law and in property law itself. It doesn't justify at all what modern copyright law has become, and Rothbard actually uses – he makes up the term common law copyright in his contract-based argument for copyright, and he calls it common law copyright, apparently not even aware that there was such a thing as common law copyright, which is different than what he's talking about. And the common law copyright he's describing, what he really means is co copyright by contract, uh, still wouldn't justify modern copyright because copyright is not based on contract at all. It, that's the problem with it is that it's not based on contract, just like this trade secret law is not based upon contract. So, um, but, but anyway, I keep getting derailed. What I was going to say is you don't have to be an anarchist, and you don't even have to be a libertarian, and you don't even really have to be a principled libertarian to oppose IP. All you have to do is realize that every justification given for it is wrong. If you're a consequentialist or an empiricist or a utilitarian, if you just look at the evidence, you will you have to at least admit that there are prima facie violations on liberty and their restraints of trade and their monopolies and their special privileges. And if your argument is that they they're necessary to um, to incentivize authorship or creative works or they're necessary to stimulate innovation. Then the burden of proof would be on you to prove it, and the fam the framers of the Constitution in 1789 didn't have any proof of this. They just as they assumed it because they were used to the the crude systems in England. So, and in the hundred, two hundred plus years since, no one's been able to prove this. Hmm. And all the studies we started doing empirically prove the otherwise, right? You know, there were sort of when I started when I really came to it, I was like, okay, I have to I have to actually decide. If there's anything left in IP that's that's at all justifiable, and there's sort of three questions that I think all have to have yes as the answer, and I think all of them clearly have no as the answer. One is, just at a very practical level, can it actually be enforced in any meaningful way? Um, like, you know, there's just so many. How do you prove that you know you didn't you weren't just independently inspired and produced something similar to me? Like the enforcement is scary in some mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two, should it be enforced? Is it philosophically sound? Is it just whatever? Uh, it seems very clear to me that that's no. And then number three is, what does it look like if we try to enforce it? Are there, and this is sort of the consequentialist one, are there actually more benefits than costs? Because it's not enough to say, oh, look, here's a case where innovation happened because someone was granted a monopoly. If you're going to be a true sort of consequentialist or utilitarian, you have to say, what are the benefits and the costs? Given everything we know about public choice theory and regulatory capture, all the same arguments we make for why uh, occupational licensing is bad and the granting of monopoly to, you know, uh, the producer of any good um, is bad, you know, is bad in, in the free market. All those economic arguments, there's there's nothing that changes there that's special about IP. So you have a tremendous burden of proof to prove that whatever benefit you imagine is going to happen in, in terms of innovation, that's all sort of speculative is not only going to occur, not only are there going to be benefits, but it's going to exceed all of the known costs, which are closing, you know, shutting out competition, patent trolls, and all these, you know, all these unintended regulatory capture. Yep. Those are known negatives. So you've got to have a lot of evidence to prove that whatever good is going to come supersedes all this, which is just impossible to do, I think. Yeah. And there's also the, the mindset kind of issue that you alluded to earlier, which took even me a while, and, and probably Jeff Tucker and my in, in, you know, endless discussion about this over the last <coughs> 10 years or so um, has even changed – we've changed each other's we, – we've both gotten more open-minded about it. And that has been a result of just experimenting and seeing – just getting used to what we see around us and seeing how the internet and open models actually work and how – they're better. I mean, in the beginning, I was theoretically writing, well, patent and copyright can't be justified, but you could probably simulate a lot of their features with a complicated contractual. So I was trying to find a way to use a contract system to do some of that, like trying to get some of these <laughs> anti-competitive things done in a permissible way, but trying to do it or trying to explain it away. Yeah, so it's like it's like constant, you know, paywalls and NDAs yeah. and th things that basically make your customers hate you because you're afraid that you won't be able to make money unless you can, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, right. So the people that believe that uh, they say that, well, maybe the current copyright system couldn't be justified, but you would get the same thing through a, a contractual system anyway. So what's the big deal? But the, the thing is – if you if you really understand how contracts would and should work and and do work, 
um, the only way you could have something resembling this would be basically for like, let's say Amazon uh, under pressure from publishers would have to make every user of Amazon click on a, an agreement before they bought a paper book or a Kindle book. And they would have to agree. I hereby agree never to use the content or to learn from <laughs> or to remember <laughs> anything I buy from you. Um, so I'm going to pay you 10 bucks for this book and I'm have to agree I have to agree to basically go to jail or pay a million dollars if you ever find if if you can ever prove that I used the content uh, illegitimately. Um, so Stephen, basically, by by showing up on this podcast, you have implicitly agreed that everything said here actually is owned by the Isaac Morehouse podcast. So if if you go out and profit from this information later, I can sue you. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's the point. The, the the few people that are not pirates that are willing to pay you money. To, to get your stuff because you made it easy for them to get it from you, you're going to penalize them the most by subjecting them to millions of dollars of damages. Um, and if you say, okay, well, then it'd only be $25 damages. Well, then that's not going to deter copying. So people would, someone would just buy it and pay the $25 fine and they would upload it to the internet and then it would be out. So the point is customers would realize that you're demanding this huge onerous burden be placed on them just to give you money to buy a book from them. They would say, screw it. I'm going to go get a pirated copy. And not be subject to this. So you would have fewer and fewer customers who are your real customers paying you money who you're su subjecting ever and ever onerous burdens on to try to make them pay for all the pirating going on out there. And it just wouldn't be a viable contract model. There's kind of a, there's almost like an abundance mindset or a confidence in the value that you have to offer the market that lets you say, look, I don't have to try to charge for everything. I mean, this is all a smart in, in the marketing world. It's like, you know, they call it whatever content marketing, like create podcasts, blogs, articles, books, give them away for free because if you have a devoted following, they that they are willing to pay you for other things. Um, you know, they'll come to your concerts, they'll whatever, buy your uh, this that and the other thing and just not being so afraid like, "Oh, I got to I got to sit on this secret and patent it and yeah. wait and wait till someone offers me 10 million dollars for it instead of just like, "Let's put this out there into the world," you know? Well, and that's of course. And if you open your eyes, you'll realize this has always been done in society. There's always uh, loss leaders and reputational effects, and you know, you 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 just have a hobby of, of painting things, and someone notices you, and they hire you to paint their kid's portrait, and that becomes a business. I mean, there's the, the problem is 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 the the mindset of the person who is for IP, and they argue against abolishing it, especially the libertarian kind of stick. You know, they're so stubborn about this. Uh, they they have an argument very similar to the liberal or the lefties argument for welfare. So, for example, if we if you and I say we should we should have a free society, there shouldn't be taxes, and there shouldn't be a welfare system, then the, the liberal will say, well, who's going to take care of the poor? And our answer is usually, well, there wouldn't be as much poor, and the ones that would that we would have would be subsist on charity. And then the typical response of the liberal is that, well, can you guarantee that? <laughs> can you guarantee there'd be enough charity? And unless you give them a guarantee, they will just dig their heels in and say, well, then I'm not going to support it, even though, of course, the government doesn't have a guarantee either because <laughs> Social Security is going to go bankrupt. So, I mean, there's no guarantee anyway. Right. But uh, – and, 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 and the mindset of the IP advocate is similar because uh, they'll say, well, how am I supposed to make money selling novels? Um, yeah. and, and I'll say, I'll say, OK, well, let's think about it. I mean we don't really know what would happen. In, in a free society, but because it's been distorted by IP law, but we can guess that, you know, and I gave the example like J.K. Rowling was some mom on welfare writing Harry Potter books on the train because she loved it. And to her surprise, right, the first Harry Potter book became a, a huge bestseller. And yeah, she, she didn't wait till she had a guaranteed income stream to start creating. No, she, she did, I don't think she did it to become the, England's richest woman uh, or second richest woman after the queen. But, um, but if there were no copyright, I mean, she still would have written, written that first book because she didn't expect to make money anyway. And she would, let's say, she published it on Kindle for ninety nine cents each, and all of a sudden it's a runaway bestseller. She makes a hundred thousand bucks, and then then the pirates come in, right? Start selling, I guess, twenty five cent copy books. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, if 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 being pirated is your biggest concern, you've already succeeded. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the pirates can't copy everything. They have to sit back and wait to see what's popular enough to copy. And by the time they recognize that. The, the work that's popular has already made at least some first move, some first market mover uh, money. But the point is she would have made some money and then she you know she had six more books in her head. She could have done a, a Kickstarter or something and she could have said, listen, I've got number 
two and three written. And as soon as I get a, a I don't know, 500,000 people who pledge $5 each, I'll release it. Now that's, you know, that's yeah. already two, five million. Okay. So that's just for book number two. So she's already worth $2 million, $3 million. And then she, if he goes on to the end, she's already worth $20 million or $30 million. And in the meantime, some, you know, say three movie studios start coming up to, uh, they start making a movie based on the first book. And they don't need her permission because there's no copyright. But one of them goes, hmm, I think I can get more, more of her fans if I get her to endorse this movie and to maybe be a consultant on it because want, they want to see the, the, the yeah. official. So they say, we'll give you 10% of the box office. So now she's got another 50 million. I mean, so I've given this example to someone who says, well, how are authors supposed to, how are novelists supposed to make money? And as soon as you give them that answer, they'll say, okay, well, what about poets? So in other words, <laughs> it's like every time you, they have this buckshot, uh, unprincipled mindset where they want a guarantee for everything. Be- because poets are doing so well currently yeah, under the current system. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you become my Angelou, the the no, poet laureate of the country. I guess that's the only way. I don't know how to make money as a poet anyway. So, Stefan, let me ask you. we got to wrap up here. And, man, there's so much more. We, we might have to do a part two to this uh, down the road. Let me ask you one, one last question. So startups are huge right now, especially tech startups, software startups. And we've done some some uh, several episodes here about startups and raising venture capital, et cetera. One thing that almost every, if somebody is going to do a venture backed startup, let's say it's a software company, every, pretty much every venture capitalist, the first thing they're going to look for is, do you have any IP? Because they want, they want some sort of, at the end of the day, it's, it's their equivalent of a hard asset in a, in a industry that doesn't have, you know, factories and and physical capital. They want to know if, if everything goes to hell and this can't be executed on, is there at least some IP that can, that is, has some value that can be sold or whatever? How do you, I feel like the incentives, it's, it's really sad because the most innovative area in the economy is sort of in these venture back startups in some ways, but they are rather than breaking down this old horrible model of IP, they're actually making it much stronger. Is there, is there a way around that? Like if you wanted to be a principled entrepreneur and not, and not go and, and, you know, copyright your, protect your software, you know, can, can you do that? Okay. So it, it, we probably don't have time to go into too much detail. So uh, I'll give you a brief answer, but I did write a pamphlet for Jeff Tucker's, uh, liberty.me, um, a little booklet, uh, a couple years ago. It's called do business without IP. It's on my website. Um, Stephen, stephenkinsella.com. So I kind of go into these different approaches to this in there. It's just pretty concise and it covers as many things as I could think of. Uh, but the bottom line is I do not believe people should, uh, uh, pretend like there's not IP. There is IP in today's world. Uh, there's basically, you know, of course everyone need, uh, well, for trademark, you don't really need a trademark to use a trademark. You just need a trademark to prevent someone else from getting a trademark. So if you get a trademark, that means you file a trademark registration with the federal government to get uh, recognition for your trademark. Uh, you know you're free to use it, and if anyone else wants to use it, you don't have to make them stop. You could simply write them a letter saying, um, I, "I'll give you. You know, you need to pay me 25 cents a year for a license if you want to do this, because you, you need to actively try to enforce it so it doesn't become generic." Uh, or you could just let it become generic, and then no, everyone can use it, and you don't care. So that's one way with trade trademark. But again, the VCs aren't going to understand this stuff, so you want it to look legit, right? And you want to be able to answer them, yeah, we have IP. Here's our trademarks. Copyright's automatic, so anyone who writes software code does already have copyright in their software. Mm. But it's become acceptable to uh, open source it if you want to. So as long as you follow the rules and do it that way, that's one thing you could do. Or you could just simply have a copyright in it and just never never sue people. That would be the principal stance to take. Hmm. As for patents, there's different things you could do. Um, you you probably do need to get patents on a few of your of your core ideas uh, because the VCs are going to ask. Um, uh, another thing you could do is you could simply make it public and therefore they would prevent other people from getting a patent on it because once it's public, that serves as a statutory bar. Oh, prior that's interesting. Call it. So you could just publish it. Publish the information because it's going to become public anyway, probably because most most patentable ideas are embodied in the products you end up selling. Um, so that's another technique you could use. You could also join. There's a growing network of these consortiums 
where companies agree, they all come together in some consortium and they all agree to never sue each other for patent infringement and to give each other a license that they need to defend themselves against a patent troll. Um, so it's like so, the opposite of collusion. <laughs> well, the, the, see, the problem is some of these things are possibly dangerous under antitrust law. So we, here we have the antitrust law, another government <laughs> illegitimate law, which, which makes it hard for um, companies to av uh, uh, avoid the effects of another government granted monopoly. Which is So under the guise of stopping monopolies, the government removes some contractual means companies have to stop – or to fight off the effects of another government, of an actual government monopoly, the patent system. Uh, but there are ways that you can use some of these techniques. Stefan, um, you are you are a patient man to be waiting through this stuff on a, reg <laughs> on a regular basis. <laughs> I think this is the first time I've ever spoken in public on IP. <laughs> Stefan, um, there, there's so much we scratch the surface. So I'm going to have a lot in the show notes. So StefanKinsella.com, you can find all kinds of stuff there. Um, Definitely check out there, – there's actually a past episode we did with Harris Kenny from Aleph Objects, which is they, they produce 3D printers, and their entire company uses no IP, uh, nothing they do, no processes, no software. It's all open source, so there's a really interesting case study. You can also go to C4, the letter C, the number 4, SIF.org. That's the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, which Stefan founded and directs. And uh, we'll link some other stuff uh, that we've mentioned here. The, the book by Boldrin and Levine will we'll link your um, Against Intellectual Property booklet as well. So Stefan Kinsella, thank you so much. Um, again, we might, have to, uh, we might have to do a round two down the road. Happy to do it. Thanks so much. Have a great one. Thanks, Isaac. Hey, if you're a fan of the show, do me a huge favor. Go to iTunes, give it a rating or a review. A rating is only a simple click of a button, or if you're on your phone, a tap of a finger. And it will help people find the show a lot easier. And if you have a little extra time, write a review. What you think about the show? Honest opinion. That stuff goes a long way in giving more exposure to the podcast. What do you get out of all of it? You get the pleasure of knowing that as more people start listening, you get to say, I was there first. 